our seven R series coordinator, Dr. Navarraza Fridi. Thank you, Mr. Gubuman. <clears throat> A very warm welcome to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. We are privileged to have with us Ms. Noreen Rahim. Uh, this is the ninth session of our webinar series, Anti-Semitism in South Asia in Comparative Perspective. And Ms. Rahim would be speaking to us about anti-Semitism in Bangladesh. <clears throat> she is an adjunct lecturer at the School of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, Independent University, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and the coordinator at the Center for the Study of Genocide and Justice, Liberation War Museum in Dhaka. Uh, Ms. Rahim holds an LLM in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights from the University of Geneva and MSS in Criminology and Criminal Justice from the University of Dhaka. She also possesses a postgraduate diploma in Genocide Studies from the Center for Genocide Studies, University of Dhaka. She has been contributing to the research on Rohingya genocide by the Liberation War Museum. The outcome of the research includes two publications, the testimony of 60 and the Rohingya genocide compilation and analysis of survivors, co-edited by her. Her forthcoming publication is a chapter titled Citizenship and Statelessness in Bangladesh. Sorry, Citizenship and Statelessness, which would be published in a volume edited by Mohammed Shahabuddin for Rutledge Contemporary South Asia series. And the volume is titled Bangladesh and International Law. Her areas of interest are international crime, international humanitarian law, migration, cultural property, etc. She would be kind enough to take questions. Once her lecture is over, you're most welcome to post your questions in the chat box. Now, without further ado, I invite Ms. Rahim to speak to us uh, with great admiration for the courage that she has shown to speak on a subject of this nature. We are most grateful to her for that. Thank you so much, Professor. And I'm really delighted uh, to be a part of this uh, webinar series and thanks for inviting me and uh, letting me uh, to explain the issues of uh, secularism and anti-Semitism in Bangladesh. So uh, I would share my slides now and then I would start explaining uh, all the details. So can you see it? Okay. So uh, my lecture uh, is of uh, four to five sections. Uh, this lecture is basically uh, explaining the origin of the Jewish community in Bangladesh and uh, their involvement in different sectors and how actually it shaped the economic development uh, of within Bangladesh. And uh, I would also explain uh, the stance or the position of Bangladesh as a secular state and how in recent times, the rise of Islamic e extremism has uh, made a very complex scenario in the state. And uh, in response to such in, uh, Islamic extremism, uh, whether the state itself has initiated any and policies uh, and if these policies would reflect any anti-Semitic actions towards its citizens. And what would be the future of Bangladesh if we uh, connect it with the anti-Semitic attitudes? So uh, let me begin with the origin of the Jewish in Bangladesh. Uh, as you can see, the settlement of the Jewish community in Bangladesh, the then East Bengal, was largely based on business and trade although the number was very few because most of them were originated from the West Bengal side. And in East Bengal at that time, uh, around 135 Jews only uh, resided in this area. Some of them were also involved in academic and religious teachings in Bengal. Uh, I will be explaining it uh, in my presentation. 
uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, personalities of this Jewish community in Bengal is Shalom Cohen. Uh, the Jews of East Bengal basically lived for commercial reasons and the East Bengal Jewish community was established by Shalom Cohen, the founder of Calcutta Jewish community in West Bengal who migrated from Surat to India in, 1970, uh, in uh, 1798. He came to Dhaka for trading silk and muslin. As you know, it's, it, it was very famous back then. And uh, for this reason, actually, he established his business with other Jewish employees here. His eldest daughter was married to Moses Dweck, a businessman from Calcutta who resided in Dhaka for five years. And during that time, uh, kind of around 1817, I would say, uh, he established a prayer hall also in the capital, which, which is now Dhaka. Uh, apart from uh, Shalom Cohen, there had been quite a few uh, Jewish people who, who used to reside in uh, East Bengal. And uh, there are, as you know, there are so many origins in South Asia in terms of uh, determining the Jewish community. So uh, there was the Bene Israel origin of Jews uh, who, who basically uh, came from Bombay uh, and uh, used to reside in the East Bengal in 1960s. And uh, throughout the 19th century and first part of uh, 20th century, Baghdadi Jews continued to run business in Dhaka. And most recent, though uh, in terms of their business, they used to uh, come into the East Bengal, but mostly uh, they used to reside in Calcutta. In this area, they traded textiles, pearls, opium, and gained a lot of profit. The University of Dhaka, uh, which is the, one of the finest educational institutions uh, in Bangladesh, it was established in 1921. And the University of Dhaka uh, had, had Mr. Uh, P.J. Hardock as the fi first vice chancellor. And Mr. Hardock uh, was the academic register uh, of London University previously, before being appointed uh, as the vice chancellor of University of Dhaka. And his father, uh, belonged to a Jewish family of Holland, which had later migrated to uh, France and ultimately settled in Paris. And uh, Mr. Hardock was a member of the Council of the Liberal Jewish Synagogue in London. This is uh, one of the establishments, as you can see. It is named after uh, Mr. P.J. Hardock, and it's the International Hall of the University of Dhaka. Another important aspect uh, is the involvement of the Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore and the then statesman Sir Khajan Azimuddin cooperated in the matter of Dr. Alex Aronson, a Jewish academic uh, from Germany who was also an academician in uh, the University of Dhaka. Uh, Aronson basically joined uh, Bisho Bharati. Uh, earlier and uh, continued to teach there until he got the appointment uh, from uh, the Department of English at the University of Dhaka in July or August of uh, 1944. When the World War II broke, uh, the British colonial rulers of India considered Aronson a Jew uh, and refugee from Nazi Germany, an enemy alien for which Aronson was sent to several internment camps and only due to repeated interventions by, the, by Tagore and Nazimuddin, he was released and remained free. Tagore also wrote to uh, Khaja Nazimuddin, as you can see in this image, um, it's the letter, uh, a conversation between, the, between Tagore and Nazimuddin. Uh, Nazimuddin at that time was an influential member uh, of the government in undivided Bengal who later served as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. As a result of this efforts of Tagore, Aronson's internment was indefinitely postponed. Dr. Aronson spent two years after that in Dhaka before migrating to Israel and settling down in Haifa. Uh, then as you can see, uh, this, this, uh, this individual is uh, Walter Leventham. Uh, he's a very uh, unique, uh, academician at that time, and he gained a very good fame uh, in entire Indian subcontinent back then. 
uh, Walter Levenson's uh, ancestors hail from the Jewish uh, milieu of Eastern Europe, and uh, his family members were mostly businessmen. Uh, his father actually converted into Christianity because uh, due to his persecution, but Walter was the one who uh, never actually uh, hide the uh, Jewish identity and he continued with his identity and uh, in first world war he was, uh, he was in the army, he was serving the army and uh, then he started to emerge as an artist after the war. And then he, uh, during the Holocaust, actually, he, he wanted to move uh, to the Asian side because uh, as an artist and, and also as, an, uh, as a student of uh, Pali, uh, Pali language and uh, aesthetics, basically he wanted to settle down in the Asian side. And then he came and uh, he was ser serving also at the Bishop Bharati. So he, he was another, uh, he was another academic who was uh, keeping a great patronage by the Rabindranath Tagore at that time. Then another important uh, and significant uh, individual in, in the history of Bangladesh, I would say, uh, he's uh, no other than Louis Aikan, uh, the Jewish Amer American architect who basically uh, shaped the national parliament building of Bangladesh, as you can see in the image, a very magnificent architecture. Uh, and the design was solely uh, prepared by him. And uh, as I could, uh, as I could uh, explain uh, the whole architecture to you, it's, it's basically uh, in the city center, in, in the city of Dhaka, and it's basically uh, surrounded with a lake and it's very beautiful and all the uh, parliamentary discussions and other issues are uh, dealt here in this parliament. Though uh, it started basically in 1961, uh, the uh, start establishment, uh, but uh, it was the whole uh, building was prepared and uh, started to operate in 1982, eight years after Khan's death. Then uh, we would move on to another uh, individual in the uh, in Bangladesh uh, who lived for so long. Uh, he's Joseph Edward, uh, who now lives in Canada, and basically he was born in Chittagong, one of the districts in Bangladesh, but he moved to Canada in 1986. So Joseph Edward's father, uh, Raymond David Baruch, as you can see in the image, uh, he was a very renowned uh, shipping industrialist in uh, back then in Chittagong. So they settled in Chittagong for so long and uh, Joseph uh, studied over there in, in the schools, colleges of uh, Chittagong and they had their own property and uh, livings over there. So uh, Joseph's older brother, Ezra Baruch, uh, who were also born in uh, who were born in Calcutta, but later he also moved in Pakistan, uh, East Pakistan at that time. And uh, Joseph's mother was a Catholic uh, Portuguese descent. Joseph's uncle, uh, the uh, elder brother of uh, Raymond David Paro, uh, he actually married uh, one of the Chakma King's daughter. Um, it's an indigenous community in Bangladesh. So uh, he uh, his. Uh, the Chakma King's daughter, uh, his wife actually died during uh, the childbirth and then the newborn uh, child was given uh, as adoption to a Muslim family. So as you can see, uh, usually uh, in South Asian context, we used to know that uh, uh, ones who used to reside in the South Asian region, uh, they were very, uh, they used to uh, keep a very secret profile and uh, they were, uh, they were only confined within their communities. It's in, not like that in the case of Bangladesh because uh, his uncle actually got married to uh, in, in indigenous communities, leader's daughter. So it's, it's a different dimension as you can observe in the Bangladeshi context. And it's the family portrait of Joseph, as you can see, uh, Joseph's aunt, Rachel, uh, then his uh, great grandfather, who was also a preacher, uh, Ezra Baruch, and uh, his father, uh, as you can see in this image. 
then uh, I would uh, move on to the uh, very last well-known Jewish resident in the country uh, who was a news anchor, Maudie Cohen, as we uh, popularly, he is known as Maudie Cohen in Bangladesh. And it's a, he was very popular figure because uh, he used to present the news and uh, it, oh, back then there was only one channel and that was Bangladesh television. And uh, he was a very popular figure back then. So Mordikohan's ancestors basically came from Iran and Iraq and then they settled in Bangladesh. And uh, Mordikohan uh, used to uh, study in Ratshahi. This is another district in Bangladesh. Uh, where his father used to run a liquor store. And Mordi worked in Bangladesh television, but he was forced out of Bangladesh after the Six Day War and moved to Calcutta in 1968. Uh, his parents actually stayed here uh, in uh, back then, uh, though due to persecution, uh, they were given proper security uh, by the uh, police uh, at that time. And then uh, Mordi Cohen and his wife never uh, returned to uh, Bangladesh only once uh, when they both were invited by the Bangladesh television and the government uh, to uh, celebrate the Golden Jubilee of the channel. So it was uh, December 2014 when uh, Mordi Cohen returned as a uh, guest in, uh, in celebrating the Golden Jubilee. Then uh, another uh, family, I would say, uh, she's uh, Priscilla Jacob, uh, who was uh, married to Alfie de Costa. And Priscilla uh, was actually uh, converted into Christianity. And so, his, uh, so her brother as well. Priscilla uh, had her own private school in Dhaka and uh, she died in 2016. And uh, the only, uh, Jewish individual that we know now still is there is Priscilla's brother Henry Jacob, uh, who also married locally and now he resides in Dhaka. Uh, and uh, so far I know he he is also uh, converted into Christianity. I uh, look for uh, some traces of the Jewish establishments in entire Bangladesh, and uh, I could find only one establishment, and that is uh, the Freemasons Hall, as you can see in the image, and uh, there is also the plaque that you can see, it's written 1910. Uh, so this is the only establishment that I could find which is related to the Jewish community in Bangladesh. Uh, there is no synagogue uh, today in Bangladesh, although a few expatriates uh, do meet up uh, privately on the eve of uh, Jewish New Year and on the Day of Atonement. And this particular establishment is uh, located in uh, Purana Paltron area in the capital of Bangladesh. And uh, presumably the, this or particular organization or this particular establishment was used by the Jewish community where they used to uh, gather and uh, have a uh, get together between themselves and uh, eat together. So this, this was one of the recreation and uh, some sort of social gathering uh, place for the Jewish community in Bangladesh. Not much details could be found at this moment because um, this particular establishment uh, was forced to seize operations by the Pakistani government at that time. And uh, this building now uh, has been used as the land ministry of Bangladesh. So uh, this is how actually, though the establishment do not have uh, much traces uh, of the earlier uh, history, but still it, it stands uh, and bears the mark of uh, the Jewish communities and uh, their involvement and social gatherings. Another important uh, site, uh, though uh, we could see only one individual and here, and that is the Chittagong Commonwealth War Cemetery, uh, all who actually died uh, during the World War II uh, were uh, basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a big graveyard in Chittagong district. And uh, there you could only find one Jew uh, soldier allied here. So, uh, Nowadays, as I know, uh, those who actually uh, in uh, after the independence, uh, there is 
no such particular place or graveyard uh, for the Jews in uh, Bangladesh, but uh, basically most of them had turned into Christianity and uh, some of them actually don't uh, get identified or likes to keep a low profile. And that's why uh, they use the Christian uh, graveyards uh, for burial process. So this is actually the reality here in Bangladesh. And uh, in the history of Bangladesh, there is another important uh, figure, uh, the Indian military commander, Jacob, who, uh, who was one of the pioneers in uh, preparing the surrender process of uh, West Pakistani armies once uh, during the independence of Bangladesh on 19, 16 uh, December, 1971. And now I uh, move on to the uh, second section. As, as you have seen, the birth of Bangladesh uh, was the, uh, as you can see in the image, the surrender of Bangladesh, uh, surrender of the uh, West Pakistan army and the independence of Bangladesh. Then the new state uh, became emerged as a very secular state. It was a vision of the father of the nation of Bangladesh, uh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. But uh, it's, it's not a very new practice, I would say, this use of uh, the practice of secularism in Bangladeshi context. Because uh, in, as you can see in, in, in the history, in East Bengal, the legacy uh, of this uh, secu national, secular nationalism uh, actually started even before the partition of 1947. And there had been quite a few important uh, organizations like the Freedom of Intellect Movement, uh, New Value Group and National Association for Social and Economic Progress who actually shaped uh, the secularist uh, attitude and the secularist politics of Biden Bengal. And uh, if I could uh, explain it to you, what actually the role of this uh, individual institutions actually, the mainly uh, mainly this uh, one of the um, institutions that is the National Association for Social and Economic Progress, it actually helped to draft uh, the Six Point Movement Charter uh, that was uh, proposed by the. Uh, the then uh, very famous leader in ba Bangladesh, and uh, he was Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And uh, um, reflecting the charter, basically, in today's Bangladesh, secularism implies uh, anti communalism where every religion is respected. And uh, this kind of secular orientation in Bangladesh is based on Bengali language and culture. As you can see, um, there had been quite a few discussions and debates in, in the parliament uh, while preparing the uh, constitution of the Bangladesh. And at that time, uh, the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was also in the power back then, uh, he actually explained secularism doesn't mean the absence of religion. Hindus will observe their religion. Muslims will observe their religions. Christians and Buddhists will observe their religions. No one will be allowed to interfere in others' religions. The people of Bengal do not want any interference in religious matters. Religion cannot be used for political ends and the politics of communalism will not be allowed. Then the constitution of Bangladesh uh, was uh, enacted and uh, the constitution actually in its preamble, uh, there had been uh, four uh, basic state principles and uh, among which the secularism has been regarded as one of the state principles. And as part of this constitution, Bangladesh is a secular state and Islam is the straight state language, uh, which is quite interesting, I would say. And then uh, it was it was going on very smoothly with a secularist approach uh, throughout the years after independence, but it it was halted uh, during the assassination of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman back in 1975. And uh, at that time, it was a military coup going on, and uh, followed by the next 15 years of this military rule, uh, the the secularist approach of nation building process was severely halted. 
and the military rulers back then eliminated secularism from the constitution and uh, they tried to establish uh, their own uh, definition and own ideas and among which uh, was the inclusion of bismillahi rahmani rahim the term uh, in constitution and also some of the uh, some of the very uh, important issues which actually uh, deals with the Islamic narratives uh, of the state. So uh, there was actually no such secularist approach in, in, in these 15 years. So uh, the citizens actually were very uh, in very anguish, but they couldn't express that much because the constitution was severely changed and uh, they actually changed and amended in such a way that could benefit their own motives. So this is how actually the secularism in that era was severely halted. And then uh, if we can see in this uh, years, like from 2005, uh, if you can see also from 2000, uh, 2001, uh, the number of the Islamic parties, uh, because as you can see in uh, Sheikh Mujib's era, uh, he actually wanted to have the equal stance with each of the religion, but uh, at the same time, he didn't want to have a, a religion-backed political system. But these days, as you can see, the number of Islamic parties uh, are, are getting involved in the politics of Bangladesh. And uh, there had been so many uh, different in, uh, political organizations at the present at this moment in Bangladesh. Though uh, the proponents of these political parties were uh, back in 1971, were the collaborators. And uh, at, in during the military era, uh, they actually, uh, two of them actually become the ministers of Bangladesh at that time. So now they are rising so much and with the involvement of uh, the young generations uh, of uh, Bangladesh and uh, they are trying to engage the youths in, in their movements and uh, halting the democracy, Bangladeshi democracy, stating that it is a Western uh, approach and having a democracy in a state is a sin against Islamic values. And as you can see, uh, in, in South Asian context, there had been a rise of uh, madrasas, which actually turning to Islamic radicalization. And uh, the in increasing influence of this extremist, I would say, it's, uh, it's reflected in, uh, in the education sector and also in, in the economic side as well. And, uh, one of the professors of Dhaka University, um, Professor Abu Barkat, uh, he reported that between 1970 and 2008, the number of Aliyah madrasas increased uh, from 2,721 to 14,152. It's a rapid growth, I would say. And the number of Qaumi madrasas went up correspondingly. By 2015, the government indicated the existence of 13,902 Qaumi madrasas. And uh, in 2017, Qaumi madrasas, which had already resisted any uh, government interference in terms of academic substance. And uh, some, in some cases, uh, they had such control in the madrasa education system that uh, some of the uh, very popular poets and their writings were very much discouraged in this uh, madrasa system. And that's why uh, poets like Rabindranath Thakur, uh, then uh, some other, uh, we have uh, Gulam Mustafa, Kaji Nozul Islam, uh, their poetries were uh, basically banned in this curriculum uh, in, in Bangladesh, and uh, which is very much alarming because uh, we also protect our culture, our tradition, and at the same time, yes, we also uh, uh, respect the religious values uh, of uh, each of the citizens, but uh, they are actually confining them within their own uh, theories and uh, own thinking, and they are not actually welcoming and the approach, the tradition of Bengali culture. So this is very alarming. And 
this is why actually the cultural uh, roots uh, and traditions of Bangladesh are being threatened. And uh, there had been so many uh, killings of the secular and atheist writers. Back then it was not a very, very, uh, I would say a very uh, regular practice that uh, banning someone or killing someone just be because of his writings. But these days, as we can see, uh, the extremists trying to uh, openly kill those people uh, for their uh, writings and their contributions. And there had been so many attacks in public places, like uh, one of the important uh, aspect of uh, our culture is uh, celebrating Pohela Boishak. And uh, in 2001, uh, basically, uh, it's a very traditional process that we start from the very morning celebrating uh, the sunrise and uh, the very first day of Bengali New Year. But, uh, uh, unfortunately, in, in one of the years, actually, the extremists targeted and attacked this uh, particular occasion, and so many people were dead uh, at that time. So this is how actually they started uh, promoting extremism in this particular state. And uh, in response to this uh, uh, extremist attitudes, basically the state uh, has been taken some rigid policies. And uh, as you know, there had been a uh, July attack, the Holy Artisan attack, uh, where so many uh, individuals lost their lives. And uh, after, uh, right after this incident, basically, uh, the government actually banned the uh, Peace TV and also another Islamic TV, uh, TV channel. Uh, because it was claimed that uh, it might uh, help to radicalize the youths of Bangladesh. And that's why they actually halted this process. And also uh, they have arrested so many uh, alleged extremists uh, from time to time. And uh, they, they already uh, initiated the counter uh, terrorism unit in the Bangladesh police to tackle this situation. Now, uh, as we are uh, dealing with the state policies, then uh, one might ask that uh, if, if the, um, the extremists always trying to explore and uh, explain that uh, the Jews are, are the enemies of the world and uh, they should be eliminated and extremely uh, given uh, subjudication, so uh, in this situation, one may ask that uh, why Bangladeshi extremists always uh, try to uh, explain the Jews and the Israel, where is the connectivity basically? Well, uh, I would say that there has been a very, uh, very uh, high tendency of relating Israel as a state and only Jews are the residents of Israel which is not right. But Israel is a, a Jew dominated country, but uh, you simply cannot say that all those who are Jews are uh, basically from Israel. So uh, here, if you can see as part of this uh, state policy in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh and Israel actually don't, do not have any uh, diplomatic tie. But Israel was one of the countries, first countries, which actually recognized Bangladesh as an independent state. But in response to that, Bangladesh uh, claiming it as an enemy state, it didn't actually accept this offer. And as you can see in the passport, it's, it's a, it's a uh, second page of our Bangladeshi passport, where you can see that this passport is valid for all countries of the world except Israel. And this is because uh, we, we, uh, we as a nation, uh, we are sympathizing for uh, pal the Palestinian cause, the Israel-Palestine conflict. And as part of its state policy, the uh, Bangladesh actually uh, explaining that, yes, uh, we will be uh, having uh, ties with you only once and also recognize you as a state uh, only once you actually uh, uh, give the Palestinians their rights and uh, uh, just stop uh, hurting the Palestinians. So this is actually the policy and that's why uh, from the beginning actually uh, Israel is 
uh, not a place where we could travel or go. Uh, and uh, whoever has already attempted uh, for such, there has been law. And uh, this law actually bans uh, traveling to and getting connected to the Israeli people. So uh, there has been two charges uh, in response to it. And one is Salahuddin Choudhury, um, who was uh, an editor of, an, uh, of a newspaper, Bangladesh Blitz. And uh, he was actually charged uh, for uh, trying to uh, promote the uh, Israeli uh, sentiments and also uh, explaining uh, that the Bangladesh and Israel uh, situation should be uh, developed and they should have some diplomatic ties and through his writing actually he was uh, promoting this issue and it actually as aid Bangladesh has charged him because uh, it thinks that it has already carved the national interest of Bangladesh. And uh, there is one uh, individual, he's Aslam Choudhury. He is one of the PNP leaders, uh, one of the uh, other political party of Bangladesh at this moment. So uh, he was actually uh, charged because he had, uh, uh, he was allegedly uh, arrested at the time because he was having a connection uh, with an Israeli individual and he was about to meet them in India. And uh, at that time, actually, he was arrested and uh, the government actually claimed that it might, it has, in, uh, it has uh, gone contrary to the national interest of Bangladesh and he might be working as a spy of the Israeli government. One of the uh, incidents that has taken place in 2017 is the uh, issue of Sadman Zaman. Sadman Zaman is a basically a 28-year-old Bangladeshi physician who uh, wanted to adapt the uh, Jewish identity. And that's why, uh, inspired by his uh, grandfather, he, he was the first one who, uh, with his own Bangladeshi passport, went to uh, the Israeli territory. And uh, that's why Bangladeshi, uh, Bangladeshi government has uh, expelled him and he cannot come uh, enter into Bangladesh again but his family is staying in Bangladesh and if they want to meet with him, uh, they are allowed to go in London uh, where he's uh, staying basically. So uh, he can meet with them uh, in, once in two years. So this is actually the present situation uh, of uh, the individual who wanted to uh, be a part of the Jewish community. Now, as for the concluding remarks, I would say that uh, this uh, the, the secularism context in Bangladesh, this is extremely, extremely threatened because uh, there has been gradual rise of the Islamic extremism, though uh, the government has uh, taken so many steps in uh, eradicating the extremism policies and also their movements, but uh, it, it's, it's on rise as we can see as the citizens of Bangladesh. And this secularism can be upholded only if we ensure the democracy and prevent this kind of extremist attitudes uh, from the political parties also to ban them because uh, their uh, extremism is actually uh, threatening, not only threatening the secularist approach of Bangladesh or uh, threatening the uh, state principles as such, but also this extremism has uh, made us uh, all thinking that uh, our, I mean, we are, we are actually getting confused that what actually the religion of Islam is actually teaching us. So um, they are actually uh, making their own narratives, own definitions uh, through their works, through their extremist attitude. And this might basically increase anti-Semitic actions in Bangladesh. And uh, that's why uh, state, the state of Bangladesh uh, should come up and uh, protect the religious minorities and as well as uh, prevent the extremism in Bangladesh. And uh, there is a very positive thought from my side in the end because um, altogether, if you can see the Jews uh, in the whole world, uh, if you can see that 
in, in the state of Bangladesh, there have been rapid growth of um, discussing the narratives of Holocaust and the Bangladeshi youths uh, have uh, got the very uh, interesting academic platforms, like there had been two institutes. Uh, one is the Institute uh, Center for Genocide Studies in University of Dhaka, and there has been a center in Liberation War Museum as well, who are actually uh, promoting the genocide prevention and uh, educating the youths of Bangladesh of the ongoing conflicts and how actually uh, these narratives can make these youths compassionate. And uh, also there has been a very interesting practice in Bangladesh I would like to share. And that is in most families, uh, when a teenager um, comes up and uh, wants to know the realities of uh, the genocide or the Holocaust, they are being gifted the diary of Anne Frank by their family members. And it's, it's still the practice. And this is how actually a, a teenager, a, a girl or a boy from Bangladesh could know what has happened back then. And this is how it becomes, uh, it makes them very much compassionate. And we also observe the Genocide Remembrance Day as well. So this is how actually uh, they're, they're learning, they're, uh, they're actually uh, realizing the spirit uh, of uh, this kind of sacrifice and what actually uh, the victims are going through in different parts of the world. So uh, there I actually conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And now I would like to uh, answer some of the questions if time permits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rahim, for your very informative lecture. We do have a few questions and we would be most grateful if you could take those questions. The first question comes from Pakistan, from a scholar friend, Mr. Fawad Javed. He wants to know, how long shall Hasina Wajid be able to withstand the pressures from the rightist forces in Bangladesh? He writes, the Iran-Arab equation in the Arab Gulf is affecting Muslim South Asian countries' Middle East policies as well as attitudes towards Israel and the Jewish people at large. <clears throat> How is Bangladesh navigating through these regional currents? Well, um, in terms of this, it's a it's a very uh, I would say it's a very political question, and uh, uh, the the government uh, in each term uh, when there is an election process, then they have their own manifestations, and uh, in in those manifesto actually they try to explain what they are going to do in next five years or four years. So uh, at present, if you can see that uh, the Bangladeshi government is involved in different uh, Islamic organizations and they have their own uh, forum and their own policies and engagements. They are also involved in some of the agreements with the Middle East countries. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a very complex question, I would say, because uh, uh, Time will actually say, because as I have already mentioned in my presentation that uh, the rise of uh, Islamic extremism is, is getting a very complex scenario in Bangladesh. So um, balancing uh, the counter-terrorism policies and also dealing with the Islamic states uh, in this situation, it's going to be very tough, I would say. So time will actually say, I can't say it any, anything very directly to this question. There is another question. Do you think a secular state can coexist with state religion? Also the priority of a specific religion, doesn't this create potential threats to the practice of freedom of speech and belief? Well, um, I'm very positive about it because uh, a secular state obviously can coexist with the state religion. Uh, because if, if the state principle is uh, secularism and uh, the, the ones who are in charge of uh, running the country is always stick 
with uh, maintaining the equal uh, facilities and equal uh, position for each of the religious communities, then definitely it can coexist uh, with the state religion. But now at this moment, as you can see in the world, uh, it's getting very difficult. And uh, I would say the, uh, the extremist attitude actually uh, puts a very bad hindrance uh, to this process. As, as we have seen in, in Bangladesh as well. So that's why I, I, I would really stress that our, our secularism is getting threatened uh, by the actions of this uh, religious uh, extremist attitudes of this uh, particular communities who are uh, sh trying to uh, have their own narratives in Bangladesh. Another question is, how can the new generation of Bangladeshis be made to understand what anti-Semitism is? Okay. Um, to be very frank, when I started researching on this issue, uh, I have been working on it for months. Uh, I, I know uh, Professor Afridi will also agree that I started working on it in January. And uh, it was very difficult for me to uh, get proper information, uh, which would be very much accessible and understandable for the youths in Bangladesh. And that's why in my presentation, I could have uh, extended some of the arguments as well, but I couldn't because there had been very less resources, I would say. I have went to several archives and several institutions where I could find something on anti-Semitic uh, attitudes or anti-Semitism in Bangladesh. But unfortunately, I couldn't find because uh, there has been very less academic work in Bangladesh on anti-Semitism. But uh, if you can have the general view of anti-Semitism going on in the whole world, I think in each state, you can see the uh, the existence of anti-Semitism. So uh, for the uh, youths of Bangladesh, if you really want to know more about uh, anti-Semitism, you can go for the academic uh, writings. Professor Afridi has written so many uh, issues uh, relating to the anti-Semitism. You can also read it out. And I am trying to uh, gather information uh, for your convenience. Let's see if I can contribute uh, this information uh, in, in a proper analysis uh, in, in my contribution that, that is going to be published uh, as part of this webinar series. Another question is, is there any information about the situation of the Jews in East Bengal during the communal riots of the 1940s and early 50s between the Hindus and the Muslims? What was East Pakistan's effective stance with respect the Jews there? Okay. Um, at that time, as uh, the, the question actually poses on 1940s, and at that time, uh, East Pakistan was a part of uh, the Indian subcontinent. And that time, uh, since the partition uh, was still about to, to happen, uh, in 1940s, basically, I couldn't find any uh, important information or any sort of uh, resources that could uh, lead me to understand the position of the East Pakistanis at that time, but, or the uh, East Bengalis at that time. So uh, I simply couldn't find any information regarding this. I'm sorry. Another question is, how can Bangladesh connect with Pakistanis and Afghans interested in promoting pluralism across the region? Do you have any suggestions? Mm. No, I, I don't think uh, I'll be able to answer this question because uh, I'm not a person who could uh, have enough uh, knowledge on this issue. So I, I don't think I'll be able to answer it. I'm sorry. Okay. Then another question is, how do you see Bangladesh being completely quiet about the Uyghurs being tortured in China? If we have to compare it with our actions regarding Israel, where is the solidarity now? How would you like to define it? 
well uh, the the uh, situations uh, in china uh, against the uyghur communities it's definitely uh, a, a huge crime that has been committed uh, inside the borders and um, as a, as a genocide uh, genocide learner i would say that uh, it, it's it's uh, i mean the state shouldn't be quiet uh of this uh, atrocities that is going on in the chinese area and as you know each state has its own policies and uh, their own diplomacies i think uh, this is why perhaps the state is silent because uh, the bangladeshi chinese relationship it actually offers uh, so many issues uh, including the trade and commerce and the initial developments of bangladesh so uh, i think it's the diplomacy and the state policy that that is giving a hindrance to this uh, responding to this crime that has been committing and uh, there should be there should be of course a sort of uh, solidarity uh, for the uyghur community in bangladesh uh, though uh, as as they, they are also supporting the rohingya communities in bangladesh who are also the um, prevalent muslim communities who who are being persecuted and coming into the bangladeshi border if we can uh, help them if we can assist them and seek justice for on behalf of them then we should also uh, give solidarity to the uyghur community in Bang, uh, in china as well what role does the bangladeshi press play in countering the rise of religious fundamentalism in the country it's a very complex scenario because um, there had been uh, quite a few arguments about uh, the bangladeshi press and media the, their position and where they are whether they are actually uh, properly addressing all these issues or not and um, sometimes uh, the the channels the uh, press who are uh, not mentioning i mean uh, extremely uh, explaining all these issues then uh, they are actually uh, getting some uh, very negative responses and also uh, a threat i would say and uh, that's why i think uh, the bangladeshi pr uh, press has uh, has been dealing with a very complex scenario as as also if we look for the existing laws of bangladesh uh the digital security and all this then i would say it's a, it's a very uh complex scenario of bangladeshi press to deal with it are you at a personal risk in doing this research and speaking about anti-semitism and anti-zionism would you say there is also persecution of minorities in bangladesh I would definitely would not like to answer to this question. I'm okay. sorry. No, no, that's okay. While Muslims in Bangladesh and Hindus in India are being extremists, do you think we just need to protect minorities? But it's a state. But if state, state policy, state policy is somewhere pushing it and need to modify for greater well-being. well i i just read out the question verbatim um well uh, i think the existing constitution of bangladesh it itself uh, is is uh, the one resource the one and only resource uh, that the state should be practicing and uh, the constitution itself has given the constitutional guarantees uh, and the fundamental guarantees to to its citizens Uh, including uh, the backward communities and also uh, the religious minorities so there are several um, i mean the constitution actually gives the equal stance of each citizen and uh, one of the provisions in in this uh, constitution also uh, mentions the development of the religious minorities so if the state actually properly practices the constitution and uh, provides the guarantees to its citizens then there will be no such uh, difficulties in dealing with the uh, minorities so kind of respecting and uh, following the constitutional guarantees is, is itself uh, it's itself uh, should be a state policy uh, of bangladesh
Thank you very much, Mr. Rahim, for answering the questions and for your most informative lecture. We are most grateful to you. And thank you once again for joining us. Um, I'm also most grateful to all those who found the time to sign in for this webinar today. Please do join us on 20th May as well, when we shall have Professor Anna Gottman uh, speaking to us on anti-Semitism in South Asian literature. Uh, now I hand over the reins to my colleague, uh, Mr. Ira Gubaman, to say the concluding words. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Rahim and Dr. Fridi for uh, putting together today's lecture. We uh, really appreciate everybody joining us on uh, many of the Thursdays throughout the rest of May at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern as we continue the anti-Semitism in South Asia and Comparative Perspective International Seminar Series. Um, if you'd like to get access to the recording, you can always visit our website, uh, isgap.org, to see uh, today's lecture and all of our past seminars as a part of ISGAP's International Seminar Series. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.